So in this lecture, we're going to cover one of your simulation exercises, which is the fabrication of a custom tray. Now, remember, in making a crown, one of the steps that we need to take is to make a mold or an impression of your patient's mouth. So the purpose of making a custom tray is to carry, confine, and control that impression material. Uh, this will help us to um, get an accurate impression as we insert that uh, material into the patient's mouth. Sometimes what we find is that when we use a non-custom tray or a stock tray, we end up having some errors in our impression. So here's an example of what we may see when we use a stock tray. Um, here we see that the tray is actually, in fact, too narrow and we can see some show through of that material and we can see that the tray is actually contacting uh, the arch. Um, one of the other things that we see is that this uh, impression is actually overseeded. So again you see show through of that tray um, and you can see that there's too much pressure put on um, and not enough impression material surrounding that particular tooth. Um, one of the other advantages of making a custom tray, customized tray is that you can uh, have an even thickness of material um, that covers the teeth and the anatomical features of the mouth. So this helps in reducing the total amount of impression material. So this uh, polyvinyl siloxane material is actually quite expensive. Um, so if you can minimize the amount of material, it will save on some costs. Um, at the same time, if you have an even layer of thickness of this material uh, throughout the impression, you're going to have less distortion uh, of your impression. So the material that we're going to use in making this tray is urethane dimethacrylate, and it's a acrylic polymer. So let's take a few minutes to um, go over the science behind these polymers. Um, these acrylic polymers tend to be pretty popular to use in dentistry um, for several reasons. One, they can be processed easily. Um, they're pretty aesthetic when it comes to making, for example, temporaries. Um, and they're also quite economical. Uh, these polymers are prepared by this process called polymerization. So if you remember from your science class, uh, this is when a bunch of monomer units start to link up to each other and form these uh, high molecular weight molecules or chains. Um, we can see that as um, the molecules get cross-linked together, they can form really strong and stable materials. One of the most popular uh, acrylics that we have in dentistry is um, polymethyl methacrylate. So we'll use this uh, typically in dentures and also making uh, temporary crowns. So let's get into the science behind this polymerization reaction. Uh, again, this is a review of your um, chemistry class I'm sure you took in your undergraduate classes. Um, but the polymerization process is split up into three steps. Initiation, propagation, termination. So in the case of our polymethyl methacrylate, we start off with it in its monomer form. And in order to start this initiation process, uh, we know that this double bond here gets cleaved to form these free radicals. So in order for those free radicals to form, we have uh, an initiator that has this free radical that will cleave that double bond there. And once that double bond is cleaved, it forms a free radical here that will then start this propagation step. So as you have a monomer unit that has a free radical, it will start to link up with another monomer unit and then form this uh, propagation step that will occur indefinitely um, until all the monomer units are used up or until that chain is closed out when two free radicals come together and close out that chain. Okay, so initiation, propagation, termination. Let's quickly go back and look at that initiation step um, and take a look at this at this initiator. So in the case of uh, our polymethyl methacrylate, our initiator is a chemical called benzyl peroxide. And this is what it looks like before it's formed in its free radical state. Okay, 
So in order for our initiator to start to take effect, um, this needs to be cleaved into a free radical. And one method in which this happens is via heat. So if we heat this benzyl peroxide above 50 degrees centigrade, this will cleave here, forming a free radical. Um, the free radical serves as an initiator that starts this chain reaction of these monomer units that link up with each other. Okay, so we call we would call this um, a heat activated acrylic, or again the heat activates this initiator. And then the initiator is the one that starts the chain reaction for this polymerization reaction. So the advantage of having a heat activated acrylic is that um, we can uh, drive the reaction to completion. So in the case of a denture, what we'll do is we'll stick that denture into a bath of hot water to allow for this reaction to take place and the heat uh, will drive that reaction to completion. So it's going to use up all of its um, initiators so that this um, polymerization reaction can be as complete or as, as dense as possible. So heat activation is one method in which we can uh, polymerize these acrylics. Uh, another method that we've developed is a chemical activation of this initiator. And if you think about it, um, there's times where we don't have access to this uh, heat or a water bath. So if you think, for example, like an intraoral situation where you want acrylic to cure in the mouth, well, obviously you're not going to be able to get uh, this material hot enough because otherwise it's going to burn or hurt our patient. So instead of using heat to form this free radical via benzoyl peroxide, we've added a tertiary amine to this um, initiator. The tertiary, amine will, the tertiary amine will serve to cleave uh, this bond here and form this free radical that again starts this polymerization reaction of the methyl methacrylate monomer unit. Okay, so the second method that we typically see is a chemically activated acrylic and that activator is a tertiary mean that works on the same initiator as we saw in the heat activated situation. So if you look at our custom tray, it's actually made out of urethane dimethacrylate or UDMA. And this particular polymer um, is polymerized in a little different fashion. So uh, this is a light activated acrylic. And what we have is uh, the initiator in this case is going to be a chemical called camphorquinone. Um, this may be somewhat familiar from your operative class as this is the same um, initiator that we see in our composite. Um, so our composite, remember we shine a light generally in that 400 to 500 nanometer uh, wavelength range um, to start this polymerization reaction of composite. Well, UDMA functions in a similar method in the sense that camphorquinone is the initiator that starts the polymerization of our custom tray material. So the custom tray material that we're using is UDMA, and its brand name that we're using is Triad. So oftentimes in our clinic, um, you'll hear students uh, asking for the Triad custom tray material. So again, this is a light activated material and we're looking for um, a wavelength in the 4 to 500 nanometer range. Um, a couple tips and common errors that we've found over the years in this exercise. Um, if you think about our custom tray, it's made off of a cast which is a replica of the patient's mouth. But we know that that initial impression that we made doesn't always capture everything to its full detail. Okay, So um, one of the things that we'll see in this typodont example is that the extension of the typodont doesn't really fully mimic what you would see in the patient's mouth. So in this area here we have the maxillary tuberosity and um, the tuberosity isn't fully captured in this impression.
So if you were to make a custom tray that fits over and beyond that maxi tuberosity, well, what do you think that's going to feel like when you start to seat this tray into the patient's mouth? Well, obviously, this portion of the tray here is going to dig into that area because what we see in the cast isn't 100% reflective of what we see in the patient's mouth. So in order to um, provide enough relief in that area, or room in that area, what we want you to do is trim that area so that it's not going to interfere with this um, um, tuberosity area. So if we didn't cut this away, what you would find clinically if you were to use this on an actual patient is that that part of that acrylic would start to dig in into that tuberosity area. Okay. Uh, last little tip is um, when you're using this trad material, it's not perfectly shaped to the arch, so we're going to have to cut it um, and use several pieces to uh, make a tray that's going to be uh, well adapted to our type of knot. Um, so in doing so, when you're making um, this adaptation, um, once you get to this curved area where the arch starts to curve, um, you're going to want to make a slit in there and then overlap the material. But you don't want this area to be too thick and have a double layer, so you're going to end up cutting sort of a triangular piece here. Um, you're going to end up seeing a seam but you can easily blend that seam together with just a uh, light amount of finger pressure. Uh, so this material before you cure it is pretty pliable and uh, adapts pretty well, um, especially when you put just a little bit of finger pressure and you kind of rub the two pieces together. Um, that soft triad will tend to blend together. So we do have a video that will go through the fabrication of this custom tray uh, step by step. Um, so that's something you're going to want to watch before um, you start in the clinic and before you start this exercise.